You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. Lovely place to be. I really enjoy being in a place and setting where there are trees in a churchyard. Most congregations, that went away as well over time in the settings we're in. But here at River Corner, you can still back under the shade trees and be aware of that presence. And then I was caught as I walked in and Gene was putting some technical support in place. This caught my eye. So right away, I asked Rhoda, what's going on there? And she said, well, there's one of you ladies that's... uh, where we're at. There you go. Uh, has just a unique way of putting sightscape together in ways that it draws us in. So there's birdhouses, particularly if they could be occupied by bluebirds, some of them could be, uh, are part of our year. That's, that's where we are right now. The birds have their first clutches of new life, and we celebrate that as we go along and and be attentive to that. So that's something you can bring to bear there, and then the beauty of all of that arrangement. The more I look, the more I see. So thank you for uh, being attentive to that, because that's how God created us, in ways that we have receptors. We have these senses that he's given us. And we use them all in the settings we're in. There's sight, there's healing, there's feeling, touch, there's hearing, there's taste, there's smell. And all of that enhances our life and enriches our lives. And the wonderful thing that happens if we lose one of those, or we're created in ways that we don't have quite the hearing we should or the sight then our other senses seem to take over and go into high gear. And uh, we're able to, then a person who is, is, is blind is able to read Braille. For us sighted people, we may put our fingers over that page of Braille and, well, I don't even feel any difference. Um, but uh, that's not the case. That's, that's just the wonder of how we're created, fearfully and wonderfully, knowing that very well. So do count that as, uh, as a blessing, that you have this created creation opportunity, that you're created in the image of God, that you're here in this place as a group, as a community of people. I've heard that term multiply this morning. You're a community. That means you care for each other. But overarching, it's Jesus' story that brings us together and binds us together because we do represent various ways of... Uh, of doing life. And that's the wonder of it all. You know, we have, we have that uniquenesses, how we're made, yet we can come together because of what Jesus has done for us and be very aware of each other's presence and be that aptness as, uh, as is written that iron sharpens iron or that there is the beauty of the, the multitude, if you will. So that's, uh, that's, where we are, where you are at River Corner this morning. Jeff, your pastor gave me a text this morning, and however you want to find your way to that text, it's uh, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And there is this word favoritism that appears, and there is this word from this writer James that you're to beware, or watch out. Or as we look at this text, we're going to see that favoritism has no place in God's story and in God's people's story. We don't. There's no place for that. However, we need to look at this text carefully from time to time because it's just beneath the surface. It's just beneath the surface. We can, can be accused of favoritism, and maybe because it's so subtle... We, we need to have each other show us, point that out for us. 
So that's uh, where we're at. Favoritism forbidden, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. That's the scope of our text. A bit of background on this short book of James. Um, it's uh, written by a half-brother of Jesus. So James, the writer of this, this little short letter, this epistle, if you will, uh, would have known Jesus very well. Would have known some of the things that Jesus had in his story of life growing up with Jesus. Some of those things that we really don't get in the biblical story out of the Gospels. But James would have known that. And then James would have been very alert to his kinship with Jesus as this uh, pattern of discipleship took place. He really would have. So as we look at the book of James, you'll find there are 12 different themes. Favoritism or this, this being partial to people or, um, how can I say this, uh, in some ways, stereotyping people, putting them in various categories that James is saying is forbidden, there's other things that pop out. He also spends some time uh, with, the, with our speech and how our tongue is to be. If you leave through that, he's, uh, he's spending time there. And it's once said that in the book of James, you can take these 12 different, um, 12 different topics and you can preach 12 different sermons on them if you're a preacher. Or you can apply them to your life in, in the boxes they're in fairly completely. They're not necessarily one building on the other, but um, they really do. It's, it's a way for us to follow Jesus closely. And that's what James is trying to encourage his readers to do. James uses some Old Testament illustration because a lot of his piece was written to Messianic Jews, Jewish people who had come to know Jesus. That's his audience. So if you use some of the translations, you'll see the word like synagogue. Well, that would have caught a Jewish person's ear. Um, it's another name for, for church, gathered group of God's people. So that's some of James' ways of, of interacting with his, uh, his readers or potential readers. Um, he also um, is rather apt to pull out some of the same themes that you'll find in the Sermon on the Mount. He really does, and uses that in wonderful ways to, to convey this matter that we have a responsibility to follow the path of Jesus and walk in his steps, walk in his ways, if you will. So, your turn to that passage. We're going to read that text, but I have a few opening comments to make. This is an illustration. The famous Indian leader from several generations ago, Mahatma Gandhi, considered very carefully becoming a Christian. He had read the Gospels, and he was moved by them, so much so that he sought out a way to find Christ. So the best way to do that for him was to go to a congregation of people gathered in the name of Jesus because he thought following Jesus and in his position of authority, a good practice in following Jesus would dispel the caste system, which was in place and to some degree is still in place in the country of India, which is favoritism to the extreme. It really is. Separating people in various classes or various castes. And the caste system was so strong you couldn't move one into the other. And, you know, there was the, the folks that had the means, and then there was the folks on the bottom side of that, if you will, the untouchables. You couldn't move between castes. So Gandhi takes his time and goes to a local church one Sunday, and he asks the pastor for some instruction how to become saved. How do I experience Jesus' story in my life? However, he enters this church. He entered the church, and he was met by ushers who promptly told him, this church consists of white people. We're not going to give you a seat. We refuse you a seat. And they told him to go and worship with his own people. He left. He never went back. And I quote him, If Christians have caste differences also, 
Obviously, this group of Christians did. Well, then I might as well remain Hindu. It's taken from an illustration out of our daily bread numbers of years ago. You may have heard that story. That is just what we need to do as followers of Christ. Reckon with the matter, number one, that people need to come to know Jesus, and also reckon with the fact that we are accepting, or we are uh, putting that invitation out there for all people. The sin of partiality, the sin of um, favoritism, is subtle, sometimes blatant, if you will. And we can experience some of that today. We need to check each other at the door, so to speak. We really do. There are movements in churches to, to minister to certain groups of people and target them. As a pastor, I was part of some of those very, very initiatives to reach out into our community. And, and I remember being at one of those, uh, those learnings opportunities, and that was what this, this uh, presenter said. You need to target the group you're going to minister to in your community, and that starts out of the DNA or how you identify yourselves as a congregation. So it's out of that, he went on to say, some people need to be reached. They might be millennials. They might be... Um, Persons who have needs, they might be persons who have means, but you need to find your market and bring people to Jesus. That's, you're missing, we're missing something if that's our target and our only target. It it doesn't allow the wonder of the Holy Spirit, who we sang about this morning, to come in and invade the space of a group of people and bring them together. Now, I understand that there are congregations that have certain ways, and that does attract people, but we need to be careful not to, to and heighten them in ways that it becomes, in some ways, a barrier, if you will. James' argument for this favoritism to be forbidden, and that's a strong word, but that's the text that... Uh, Jeff and I agreed to, and the title, um, comes from these first few verses of James. However, it goes beyond that. So there will be some words that more than likely Jeff will have for you in the coming weeks because this whole piece of favoritism uh, winds up, if you will, in the 13th verse. I'm going to stop at verse 7. And I'm going to read this text for you this morning. And the reading of this text comes from New King James. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. My brethren, do not hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality or favoritism. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in this good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown Partiality, have you not shown favoritism among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren. God has not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in, the, in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? And that's the end of our text this morning. And that noble name by which we are called is Christian, followers of Christ. I make mention of that now. This next slide, Gene, if you will. 
this, this whole piece of favoritism usurps or robs God's sovereignty. This is James chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And then I have A and B under that. Favoritism puts humankind as a judge in place of the Lord Jesus Christ. That happens. Favoritism also puts humankind as sovereign in the place of God. Both of those are spots that we really should not be in. We're not God. We're not in a spot where there's a judgment seat necessarily. We don't necessarily have an understanding of what has gone on in someone's life to put them at the place they're in. We rather should encourage them, have them to walk in a way that takes them toward Jesus. Usurps, robs God's sovereignty. That's what happens when we show favoritism. James uses an endearing term quite quickly here. Brothers and sisters, or brethren, and do- desiring that this group of people that he's writing to come to grips, that they're together in this, and that they're supposed to pay attention and listen, because I have something to tell you. In the structure of, of how he addresses these, um, this group of, of people he's writing to, there's some construct of the language set. So as he says this, brethren, you know, be aware of what's going on. Do not hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with favoritism. In other ways of looking that at that sentence construct, which would have been in Greek at that time, would have been to come to grips that James says, actually, stop showing favoritism to the folks he's writing to. Mostly the little group of church of Christians in Jerusalem stop showing favoritism. That's how the construct of the original language is. And I guess I could could bring that to bear this morning if there's any hint that we have that we're showing partiality or favoritism in our our way of doing community, whether that's in this group of God's people or as we minister to those around us, stop it. Stop doing it. James is writing to correct a problem. James brings that to bear in ways that he goes and puts an illustration in place. Hypothetically, but it may have actually happened in the setting of community he was in. And this hypothetical scenario is such that there's two men. One man is fine and rich and has means. Robes and rings are mentioned. And the other man is poor and poorly dressed, and, and obviously had some needs. And he goes on to say, you usher the wealthy man in, the man who has all that he needs and more, you usher him into a place of, of wonder and resolve. And yet you take the poor man who has clothes that are unclean and shabby And you direct him to the side. I remember some years ago, in a setting I was in at one of at a church meeting, this was illustrated in in ways that brought it to bear. It seemed like ah, that's not something that I would want to participate in. That's not something that I'm guilty of, is it? Yet I pause to think of times that I may have just done that because there was this subtle need. Sometimes as a pastor you find yourself relating to various people along the way. And for me, in my time as I was an active pastor, there were persons that I faced that had tremendous needs. So sometimes as I ministered to those folks, I, would, I could become worn out. I really could. So if a person appeared in the setting I was in, whether that was in congregational life or in my community, that didn't have that going on, I could have been and more than likely was guilty of favoritism toward that person because for me it was a bit of fresh air. But I had to think as I looked in ways, as I studied this text, how could I bring that in different ways? Well, that's the beauty of God's people being together in community. You have persons 
in all settings of life that are brothers and sisters of each other that are loving each other and looking out for each other. And that in and of itself has us to be able to push back against this, this favoritism, push back against judgment that so easily, well, catches us or ensnares us. Be aware that we are not Jesus. I think you're aware of that. So that puts me in this matter that I'm a child of the King and that I have to be quite aware that Jesus' story can be for all who will believe. All who will believe. And that's why it's so important for us to convey this this being against favoritism in our story of life because we are not Jesus. We can introduce folks to Jesus, encourage them to come to know the Lord in the setting they're in, and that's transformative, but we then are rather messengers bearing that good news of this transformation that can happen rather than being in a judgment seat and being apt to put persons in categories. There is this matter of fact that favoritism B in this slide puts man, puts humankind as sovereign in the place of God. That's not a good place to be. God has provided a way for us to approach Him. His way for us to approach Him is based on grace and peace and His love. One of the favorite verses, one of my favorite verses, is 1 John 4.19. We love Him because He first loved us. It's God's love that we convey that has been conveyed to us, if you will. And in this setting, uh, James is che- che- teaches overall that God and his perfect love in his way of salvation desires that everyone would come to know him, that everyone would have this chance. I think we're aware as we look at the story of, of uh, God's word, and particularly thinking of Jesus' ministry and those gospel accounts we have, but there are Old Testament stories that reflect this as well, that it, God's story and human story tends to be better out of ministry to persons who have a need. Yes, there are persons who responded to Jesus' call in their lives, to God's call in their lives that had means could name a few, Nicodemus, Barnabas, Philemon, Zacchaeus, responded to God's call and had plenty to share with others. We know the Zacchaeus story particularly is transformative, but we also know that there was opportunities for, for Jesus' ministry to be open to ways with people who had needs. Much of the healing that Jesus did was to persons who just didn't have any other recourse, any other recourse at all. If we think of how Jesus ministered to, to women in general, who were persons that would have been lower on that, that's, that uh, scheme of community. We think of Jesus and how he ministered to people that were blind, people that were not able to walk, persons that had illnesses that plagued them for years. These were folks that had restorative and wonderful opportunities to celebrate not only a physical healing, but it was out of that that there was a spiritual healing as well. And that's what we need to convey. Rather than think we have some answers in our favoritism or picking and choosing who we like, 
playing like we're a little more of a sovereignty rather than, than a servant of God, uh, we have this opportunity to draw others to draw others to Jesus. I think the next slide, Gene. Favoritism is wrong because it aligns us with God's enemies. And we're going to transition now to the next part of this text, verses 6 and 7. And we're going to be just touching on the fact of the matter that God's enemies can use their strengths to prevent, per, excuse me, to oppress those with needs or the poor. And then God's enemies also blaspheme the name by which Christians are called. Let's talk about that a bit. Let me reread verses 6 and 7 of James chapter 2. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? That's the text that we want to spend just a bit of time on this morning. This matter of fact that God's enemies, and they are there, persons that have yet to come to know Jesus, that's how I like to term that, can often confront persons with needs in ways that there's oppression. In our days and times that we live in, we have systems of court and law, but it would appear that when a person who is found out to be doing something that is illegal, if there is some means or some money, the legal system can be thwarted. It can be not nearly as impacting on a person's life as a person, as another person who has a, a intertwining with the law and has some dealings with it and doesn't have means. They seem to have to pay for their um, ways. Seems unjust. Seems unfair. Have us to be. I, I want us to be aware this morning that we we are not at that spot. As we interact with people, as there are people around us, let us be aware that we have this opportunity to encourage them along the way. We have an opportunity to, to lend a coat and a cloak as well, to be persons that are for, apt to forgive and set folks free rather than holding them to task. I think that's a basic tenet for the position of theology and faith that we have. We work in ways that we bring peaceful resolve to situations that we encounter because we'd rather not go to a court of law. We'd rather not get involved and intertwined in ways that it seemingly um, is just tangling and besetting. As persons choose their way, particularly persons who are partial, are fav showing favoritism, they in essence can, can blaspheme. That's a strong word as well. They can blaspheme the name of Christ. They're not standing for, for his ways. They're not standing at all in his presence when they do something like that. And so in that setting, I encourage us as well, as we're following Jesus, as we're following Jesus, to be aware that there's that way that we do that that is a higher road, a way that God calls us to as Christians, as followers of him that are, that's set apart and people can see, can see in wonderful ways that we have this, this way about us that um, encourages folks to leave the way that they may be living life behind and set a new course which is focused on Jesus and his ways. Concluding slide. We want to apply this teaching of, of James this morning by showing love to every person and favoritism to none. 
You may jot that down if you want. It could be jotted down in a way that you see that. Because I think I said earlier in this message that it's, it's there, just beneath the surface. We can be guilty of it and need to have the help of God's people in community with us to point, us, point it out to us that we need to amend our ways. So let's, let's try to be people... Let's try to be people this morning as that we can apply James' teaching. Be those followers of Christ that put this teaching of James on top of that, that we show love to everybody and favoritism to none. Favoritism to none. Have that to be uh, a wonderful way that this congregation here at River Corner does church. Maybe some of you have testimony to that effect this morning that the, the folks here at River Corner have, have ministered to you in ways that there is this wonder of transformation and hope that comes through Jesus. We don't feel threatened here. We don't feel set aside here, but rather we're encouraged to follow him more carefully and closely. I challenge us in this particular passage to reread it. There may be some applications you have personally that you couldn't put in place. You may want to spend some time praying on this particular passage of Scripture and as the Holy Spirit interacts with you. We sang this morning, Come Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit interacts with you, as you read this passage, allow that to be transformative. Allow that to be a a word that comes in wonderful ways that you are not a person that shows favoritism, but rather a person who follows Jesus and follows him so closely that you um, are his hands and feet to bring healing and hope to a world that severely needs it. Let's pray.